Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started um, on behalf of the Gillings School of Global Public Health Office of Research, Innovation and Global Solutions. I'd like to welcome you to our second event of the semester, a journey of Gillings student innovators with Newman Carpenter. My name is Ann Glauber and I'm the Associate Director for Research and Innovation. And we are thrilled to have so many of you joining us here today. A uh, little housekeeping before we get it underway, we are recording the event and it will be posted and available uh, on our website. Uh, we'd ask you to remain on mute and utilize the chat function for any questions or comments. We will pause at the um, conclusion of the presentation to read out any questions from the chat. Actually, we're gonna pause twice, once um, about 20 minutes in and then a little bit closer towards the end. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Siani Antoine. She is our graduate research assistant working in our unit, and she is behind the scenes making sure everything runs smoothly today and did a lot of preparation for this. So thank you, Siani. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speakers, Emily Newman and Catherine Carpenter. Emily is a public health practitioner and an award-winning television producer with over a decade of experience producing reality TV in New York City. She received her BA at the University of Pennsylvania and her master's of public health here at Gillings and Health Behavior. A North Carolina native, Emily is a certified health coach, designer, mother, and the founder of At Move Your Booty, an online fitness community. She is passionate about health equity and loves using photo voice to engage with communities. Catherine is a public health practitioner and a linguist and educator. She was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska and has an MA in Applied Linguistics and Language Teaching from the University of Oregon. And she's also an MPH alum here from Health Behavior. She's worked as a tenure track professor, a research assistant, a curriculum developer and designer and has extensive experience working internationally and in low resource contexts. Together, both Emily and Catherine love coming up with creative ways to make information more accessible. They envision a better way of communicating health information to improve health equity, to help people receive access to information and resources to live healthier lives. Their combined passions led to the creation of Newman Carpenter, a public health startup that designs creative tools and strategies to improve health. We're very honored to have these phenomenal women here today, and I will go ahead and pass it on to them. Thank you, Anne. Um, I will go ahead and get us started here. Uh, as Anne said in that wonderful introduction, we're Newman Carpenter, a public health communication agency, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we do as a company and also kind of walk through how we set up while we were MPH students uh, from 2018 to 2020. Um, as Anne said, I'm Catherine Carpenter. Before I came to public health, uh, I was an educator working mostly in university contexts. Um, I have a master's in linguistics and language teaching and was doing that at a university in Mexico and then as a Fulbright grantee to Portugal. I really was interested in health communication and how I could apply the educational aspect of my work to public health. Um, and so that's what brought me to Gillings. And I will let Emily introduce herself real quick as well. Great. Um, so I'm Emily. Thanks to everyone who put all this together today. Um, as Catherine said, so prior to Gillings, um, well, and also this is my two month old daughter, Penelope. She's gonna be participating as all the children have throughout all the pandemic. <laughs> um, so I studied communications at Penn a hundred years ago um, and went to work in the television industry and reality TV in New York. And I worked at networks like MTV and Food Network um, and ended up at a production company where my job was to pitch and sell reality TV show ideas. Um, about a decade in, I realized that well, while I was also doing that, I also created Move Your Booty and was a certified health coach. And so I realized that um, when my full-time job was getting people to sit on the couch and watch more and more and more television, um, what I really wanted to do was get them healthy. And those two things were sort of working against each other. And so eventually I left television, um, found myself back in North Carolina and wanted to focus on health full-time, but also not work on an individual basis in health, but work on the population level, uh, which is what brought me to Gillings, which is also where I met the lovely Catherine. Um, and I, it was one year into our program that I asked her to grab coffee with me because she, I was sniffing around what she was working on because she also was interested in health communication. And she kept saying that she'd applied to all these like amazing summer jobs 
in health communication and I had applied to like one. And so I really wanted to pick her brain and see what she was, where she was getting all this great information. Um, and it was at that coffee where we sort of sparked the idea for Newman Carpenter. So today Newman Carpenter designs creative tools and strategies to improve health. As Anne said, um, often our clients come to us as experts on a specific public health issue that they wanna communicate about, but they don't always know how they want to do that or what that communication tool is gonna to look like. And so we sort of help them figure that out in a number of ways and then produce the content and the tool itself. So let's go through some examples of what those tools actually look like to give you an idea. So these are two examples of our work. Um, we were asked to consult on a project with UNC Lineberger um, okay. as they were targeting uh, youth vaping prevention. And so they were working on a website already that um, was trying to bring together all the different prevention materials that different states create separate from one another. And they wanted to bring them all into one space so that academics, community members, and also um, health you know, practitioners could also use and access in a free source. And so we helped their designers kind of, um, we consulted on this website. But then we also had the chance to create our own website with um, a task force in the early, early days of COVID, March 2020, between Gillings and UNC Health. And so the problem they were targeting was that um, obviously medical workers were, you know, in dire need <laughs> and all the schools and daycares had shut down. And so they needed a way to communicate about emergency child care resources, about funding opportunities um, in a way that was really clear, accessible, and that could be updated as fast as all the information we were finding out about COVID was changing day to day and hour to hour. And so we worked with them to create this website. Um, did I skip ahead? No, we're good. Um, video is often a really accessible tool, obviously, as we all know, um, to communicate about health. Um, but often it's kind of inaccessible um, for people to make. And so we help our clients do that. Um, animated videos have become a really great way for us to produce content in COVID days where it's really hard to get a whole group of people into one space. So for these two projects, um, we partnered with UNC Wilmington Center for Healthy Communities. They wanted to communicate about COVID issues and they had a partnership with three um, Eastern North Carolina health departments. They especially wanted to target communities um, that were underreached in those rural, really rural areas. And so we did um, a, a big kind of outreach to communicate with a bunch of community members who told us what they needed, um, which was communication about the mandates and the guidelines themselves um, in COVID as like mask wearing and hand washing at the time as they changed constantly throughout this project, um, but also about misinformation and kind of dealing with mental health throughout the pandemic. Um, we also had the pleasure of partnering with an amazing psychiatrist out of DC um, who came to viral fame after she made videos about how COVID and racism were interconnected that were featured on Now This. And so she wanted to um, continue the work she was doing and communicate about um, really targeting vaccine hesitancy specifically in black and brown communities. And so we worked with her to help bring her ideas to life and produce animated series, um, some of which were also featured on Now This and other social media platforms. I think when we all think about public health materials, we all think about pamphlets um, that we might get in the doctor or in any number of different places. And often they're really dry and full of just empty text and really boring. And so when we're asked to make print or digital materials, we really, really, really think about how to make them accessible, interesting, and really useful in a tangible way. Um, so these are two, these are two examples of a a uh, booklet that was produced um, for the North Carolina HIV Training and Education Center that went out to North Carolina clinics. So this booklet focused on PrEP uptake and gender affirming care. Um, these two topics were identified as really tough issues to talk about both for patients and the providers serving those patients. Um, these booklets were created to be trauma informed, destigmatizing, super accessible, and to facilitate conversations between the patient and the provider. So they were meant to literally be in the waiting room where a patient would pick them up and bring them in to their appointment with the provider to help those conversations go both ways. And now that all things are virtual, they're, they're sent out virtually um, for video appointments. So those are some materials. We've also created materials around um, topics like prenatal health and HPV vaccination. And Catherine, I'll kick it back to you and mute me and my chatty baby. 
She's so chatty. She loves to be a part. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about um, the process that we use when we're actually doing this work. So we've talked about the, the products we do, but I've just briefly we'll talk about our process. So um, this isn't anything new. Um, it probably isn't unfamiliar and follows sort of general best practices for this type of work, but having this structure has really helped us um, and make sure we're able to do the most impactful and informed work. So we start by understanding the needs from the organization's perspective. So this is the organization that has hired us that we're working with. We wanna make sure we understand like, what do they want the outcome to be here? What are they targeting? Um, we supplement this with an understanding of the empirical research. So we often do a literature review. Um, this can include literature review of the health issue of the specific population, if that exists of any behavior change research um, that has been done around the specific population. Um, we then work directly with the community as much as possible to understand the issue from their perspective. So this can include, sometimes it's surveys, sometimes um, if the organization we're working with has an understanding of the community, then we just get that understanding from them. But it most often, as much as we're able, we do interviews and focus groups. So we incorporate elements of user-centered design, human-centered design, community-engaged research to understand um, from the community members themselves, where do you access your inf information? How do you see the problem? Um, like, what does this look like from your, is what the organization is saying is the issue, is that actually the issue? Um, and so that all uh, informs what we develop. And then with their permission, we also work with them um, to follow up as we develop products and make sure there that we got it right. And we often have to change it throughout the process. Um, so with all the information that we gather through that process, then we develop and present concepts and products to the organization. So we choose um, what do we think is the medium that's gonna work best? Where are people getting information? What does that information look like? Um, and we develop and iterate those um, and then deliver them to the organization. So um, we provide dissemination guidelines. We generally don't do dissemination ourselves because we're working with the organizations who have those methods already. Um, but that is sort of the process that we use um, to do this work. So we've kind of given an overview of what we do. Um, we're next going to talk about how we set up and like the innovation pipeline and all of that that we went through. But I want to pause here first for questions just on us as an organization and what. Thanks, Emily and Catherine. I don't see anything in the chat right now. If anyone wants to unmute and um, offer anything, otherwise we can go on to hear what the rest is. Okay, why don't you go ahead and dive into your journey? Sounds great. Um, so this is a timeline of how we actually set up the business. So Emily and I met up in summer 2019. And um, as we kind of said, we decided to explore how we could bring our past skills and experiences into public health and health communication. We hadn't really been finding the type of work and projects we were looking for and so wanted to explore um, doing our own health communication a little bit more. So Emily had heard about something called Startup UNC. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, um, but we went right into it. Startup UNC, it's a it's through Keenan Flagler. It's a four quarter, so full school year, their own quarters, um, class in the business school where you take an, a business idea from um, idea to launch, essentially. So there's a big focus on validating your idea through lots of market research interviews, um, being able to describe and pitch what you do, um, fundraising in some cases. Um, it was really helpful for us to kind of focus the business on what was going to be most helpful for the organizations we were going to work with, understand how our funding was going to work and how to describe ourselves. So we did that our whole final year of, um, of the MPH. Um, our first client was Pro Bono uh, and we were able to work with her in September 2019. So we had the idea in August 2019. This first pro bono client was in September 2019, so pretty quick. Um, and she was a UNC researcher who had a really cool finding from a study, but um, she had published a paper, but she wanted to get the word out a little bit more. Um, and we created a very simple graphic for her about the findings of her study. She posted it on Twitter 
and she was able to reach the relevant person at the FDA through that. So that kind of was a very simple, very small example, but it was a little boost for us, like that this is a really impactful thing and that this communication matters and um, can have, you know, can have an impact. Um, we were hired as two students in October onto that Limeburger project that Emily was talking about, the youth, youth vaping prevention um, website. So we worked on that as students. Um, we were, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but we were able to kind of get the word um, out with support from Gillings and from Innovate. Um, so we were featured in an article that later led us to getting um, one of our larger clients earlier on. Um, there's a, a law clinic called um, the Startup Law Clinic, I believe it's called. We got support from TWICE. So they take on pro bono clients on a term basis. There's a, a group of legal students in the third year um, who work with a professor and they'll um, help you with like discrete projects that you, you need help with. So the first time we worked with them um, was late, I guess early 2020. And they helped us come up with a standard contract that we amend and use um, for the organizations that we work with. And they also helped us um, come up with our operating agreement, which is the contract between Emily and I. Um, and then when we used them a second time, they helped us get set up as a historically underutilized business or hub. Um, and that is a business that has a majority ownership by women, disabled people, or POC. And some um, organizations have requirements to hire a certain proportion of their businesses, have them be hub businesses. So that's like a big benefit if you can get that certification. Um, we, in early 2020, we were hired as two independent consultants. So we weren't an LLC yet, but we were hired as two independent consultants for a group of maternal child health clinics um, that were producing materials for pregnant people um, to kind of help them access medical information. We got funding from 1789, a little teeny bit of funding that allowed us to purchase some software. We were also able to use their space for free, which was amazing. We were able to take a lot of our more formal meetings from their meeting space and we worked there a lot. Um, and um, like I said, we did start up UNC for all four quarters that they do it. Um, and after that, we moved right into Chapel Hill or sorry, to launch Chapel Hill. So we did that for a year. We graduated with our MPH May 2020. And then I think May 2020 or early June 2020, we started Launch Chapel Hill. So Launch Chapel Hill, for those who aren't familiar, is an accelerator. We were part of the first virtual cohort as COVID had just started. Um, you get mentorship and guidance. You go to lots of talks about getting set up as a business. Um, you get a few thousand dollars to help support you as you go through the accelerator. It's a really great program. And our time there and connections there helped us with some of the business logistics that we wouldn't have necessarily um, known about or known how to set up. So like our insurance and how to get set up as an LLC and like what our company needs to be structured as and what our financial model needs to look like. Just all of these things that you have to have in place if you're going to be doing business, but we didn't have the background on. Uh, we were able to officially register as an LLC in North Carolina in July 2020. And we've since worked with health departments on COVID prevention and vaccination. We've worked with uh, researchers and university centers on HPV vaccination. We've worked um, with lots of different types of clients on lots of different types of projects. We're usually hired by universities or health departments always as an LLC ever since the LLC has been set up. Um, we do pro bono partnerships on occasion. For example, the project um, with um, Dr. Cyrus, um, oh hi Marjorie, um, who um, wanted to increase vaccine uptake. And we've worked with the Gillings Innovation Lab and, and throughout for help with connections, for getting us set up as a public health business, which is kind of a unique intersection that I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, but we worked with tons of support from UNC um, and we're really lucky to be able to have all that support. So I, I wanna talk a little bit more about um, what was the most helpful and then what was unhelpful as we were getting set up. Um, so we, we've thought about this a lot because we learned so much through this process and we've kind of tried to narrow it down to a few pieces of advice for what's helpful if you're trying to set up and doing your own public health work. Um, the first thing, everyone brings their previous experiences to their public health work. So this can be 
research you did in your undergrad or your past jobs or your own lived experience that's really useful in carving out um, the work that you will do. Emily and I were able to develop this company because when we came to public health, we looked at our unused skills and experience and said, why am I not using this? Emily had worked in TV production for years. She knows how to produce really high quality communication materials. She knows and loves storytelling. She's super creative. I was a teacher. I worked in really low resource context. I know how to make things accessible. I know how to make things relevant to people. I know how to help them learn. So this wasn't the first time we tried to bring those skills into public health, but this is what we found to work best. Um, talk about it. We mean this in several ways. Talk to the people in the space you want to be in. How did they get there? What are they doing? Talk to the potential people you would be working with. What do they need? How can you provide what they need? What are their budgets? Um, where do they do their hiring? Do market research interviews. But even more than that, just let people know what you're working on. Um, every time we've gotten hired, it's because someone has heard about us, often from someone who we told about what we were doing or an article that we did that in some cases we pursued or that came to us because we told someone about what we were doing. So just talk about it all the time. We got that advice early on and it feels, you can feel really annoying, but you have to do it anyway. It's really, it's really um, beneficial. Um, do the work. We really jumped in and started working and started putting ourselves out there in some cases before we felt ready. Uh, one very early example that maybe Anne will remember is um, the pitch party. So the pitch party, is this big event put on by Keenan Flagler where early stage businesses just come and pitch. It's a competition. Um, and if you get the most votes basically on your pitch, you win some money. We did not win, spoiler alert. Um, and so we were not really ready to go. We um, went anyway, we pitched. Anne was one of the first person we pitched to and she was like, this is terrible. You need to change the way you're describing your business. And she was right. And so we did change it and it really helped. We got to pitch, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 times to people that night. And we got to see like, what resonates? What do people care about? What's, what's clear? Um, it, so it, it really helped us kind of develop um, how we talked about ourselves as a company and the services and, and ultimately the services that we provide because we were able to see like what do people care about. Um, but again, we did that before we were ready and it was hugely impactful. Another example is our early client work. We knew that we could do the work, but we didn't have a solid structure in place and we did it anyway. So there's, there's definitely pros and cons to this, but I think our experience has shown that if you really want to make a business work, you have to start doing the work before you're ready. Um, the next thing is find champions. This, this means to us to find people who will connect with you when you need support, who will respond to your email when you need, when you have a really specific question, who will hire you when you're young, uh, who care about the growth of your business and is one of these people for us. So is Kurt and Liz and Melissa and Scott and Tim and Velvet and all these people that we have met through doing these programs at UNC and in Chapel Hill at Gillings at Keenan and Flagler. So having these people, we would not have been able to do it without having these people. Their mentorship and guidance and support has been invaluable. And then the last thing is find support. So UNC has tons of support for entrepreneurs. That could be little bits of funding. That could be programs. That could be the law clinic that we did, Launch Chapel Hill, uh, Gillings Innovation Lab. There's lots and lots of support out there and it helps provide structure to what you're doing. It helps provide accountability. It gives you mentorship. They're all, um, really, really important things to take advantage of. Um, I want to talk also about what was unhelpful. Can I jump in with a couple extra things just to piggyback off all of amazing yeah. stuff you just said? Um, I think coming from, and this kind of falls into five and six of find champions and find support, but working for 15 years before I came back to school, you realize just how many resources there are for students. Even just a call coming in to someone at a corporation or organization that says, I'm a student and I want to learn about XYZ is a very different call than, hi, I want a job. <laughs> you know, like just that, that changes the tone um, of what they're willing to share with you and kind of bumps you up to the top of the list. And then to come, you know, back to school with a place where there's like, per, you know, even just moments like this and these sort of lunches and sharing moments or startup UNC course at the business school was so refreshing to just like step outside of Gillian's for a second after a really crazy year of school, as you all know, and, and 
just dive headfirst into the entrepreneurial world in a very different way it was just a totally different um, and really refreshing thing to do that made us legitimize our business in a different way. Um, so just really learning what the school has to offer because there's even more than you realize. There's even more outside of Gillian's. There's even more um, even just in the town of Chapel Hill and to really like get your money's worth and take advantage, um, especially like Marjorie, who's here, who helped us with the start of clinic. That is like invaluable help um, to get legal help like that, that's so intimate and personal and they give you so much time. So like really take advantage of that while you're in school. And okay. now and I'm piggybacking on your piggyback, but like, I feel like a lot of the, the programs we did, we weren't even sure we were eligible for. Like Startup UNC, we were like, are they gonna take us? Is there what they're looking for? Launch Chapel here, we're like, I don't know if we're eligible for that. And we like, so go for it anyway. I think we were at the intersection of a lot of different things and I think we really found that the, the, the UNC and the Chapel Hill innovation ecosystem really, really wants to help more than any other organization that I, I personally have had experience with and they really wanna make it work. And that has, has been, um, yeah, invaluable, like Emily said. Um, okay, can I go to the next slide, Emily? <laughs> so we found it's, it's sometimes hard to know where to spend our time. Um, it's just the two of us and we're running a, a, a company. And um, we also, as you can see, have other priorities in our lives. So it can be really hard to know where to spend our time. And we sometimes find ourselves spending a lot of time on applying for one grant or one bid, and then it doesn't pan out. And that was months of our time. So we've learned as we've gone on more, what is worth our time and what isn't. Um, and but that's still a learning process and is still a really big challenge. Um, relatedly, spending time on the work that we do for the organizations we work with and spending time nurturing the company are both big pulls. So it, it's a really hard balance. You know, we have work for the communities and the organizations we work with, but also maybe we need to meet with a lawyer to go over our contracts, and it can be hard to to balance those needs um, and kind of walk that line. Another thing we found to be unhelpful is spending money on unnecessary things. We almost rented a space in early 2020 and we are now fully virtually, fully virtual and live in two different states. We did not need a space, but we thought it would be nice. And so it's, it's really useful to stay bare bones as, as long as you possibly can. Our expenses include our insurance, our accountant, a computer, and a few hours of a lawyer's time. And that's that's it. We don't have anything else. So just trying to stay, if, if, if you're not familiar with business expenses, that's very, very lean. It's trying to stay as lean as possible, as long as possible, and only spend money on things when you really, really need them um, has, has helped us survive. Uh, and just a quick note on that, you get, as a student, you get so much software for free. Download it all before you graduate, because <laughs> you'll, you'll need it and you'll have to pay for it in the future. Um, more unhelpful things. Next slide, Emily. Thank you. Um, we have had to balance a little bit between two worlds. We're firmly, firmly in public health, which is often, for better or for worse, an academic and government-led field. Um, Funding-wise, the norm is that people who work in public health should expect limited budgets and don't have room for innovation or for businesses. So we've had to partially learn how to counter that and partially learn how to work within that. Um, but a public health business is not something that many people are familiar with. And we've kind of had to learn how to explain that and work within that culture a little bit. On the other hand, startup culture is focused on profits and we're a lean mission-based organization. We take on low budget and in some cases pro bono work. So businesses obviously have to be profitable but there are other things that are important in the work we do. We are a public health business. So there's this focus in the startup and business world on making as much money as you can and growing as fast as you can. We wanna grow, we need to be profitable, but we don't wanna push ourselves out of our depth and we don't wanna push ourselves out of our mission. So this is something, a, a line that we have to walk. Um, and actually, Anne, I don't know if we mentioned this, but you have really helped us balance this at times. Um, and there have been, people who get it have helped us kind of 
how do we present this? How do we work in these two worlds? Um, how do we describe to people what we do from these two worlds? Um, and how do we uh, make sure that uh, we get people on board with what we're doing from these two worlds? Because we do kind of work at the intersection. Um, Emily, is there anything else you want to add here? Um, yeah, I, I think we found ourselves in the business school startup class explaining that a for-profit public health company was possible. Um, they were sort of confused by like that public health wasn't just healthcare and things like that. Um, they were confused that we weren't going after crazy amounts of funding. Um, but you know, we found that there, like we, when we were deciding between nonprofit and profit LLC, we were trying to figure out a reason to be nonprofit and we didn't find one. And so, um, because so many other public health organizations are nonprofit for good reasons, um, as a creative agency, we actually didn't find that. We found that for profit was better. Um, so, yeah, just kind of, we had to sort of create our own space and that was a good thing because it really helped us figure out what we were, which we were also figuring out at the same time between these two um, worlds. Yeah. Um, I think that's all we have that we want to present, which is actually great because we have time for discussion. Um, if anyone has any questions and Anne, I guess I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. This is great um, information. So we do have one that's written in. So your use of Innovate Carolina's resources is inspiring. You both came to Carolina with such impressive experience and credentials. What is the increment of incremental value in particular of your MPH degrees? Like, where does that give you an edge? I can, I can start with this one. Um, I came to Chapel Hill in 2016. Um, you know, as a TV producer and health coach and, you know, was venturing out to find sort of what working in the health space would be. And I didn't find much from, like, I didn't, I didn't break down a lot of doors um, because it didn't make a whole lot of sense for a reality TV producer who dabbles in health to work fully in the health space um, for jobs that were already sort of created. And so it wasn't until I went to Gillian's in 2018 that A, it helped me round out like what my skills were and how to frame it better. Cause I didn't know that this is what I wanted to do coming into this. Um, I sort of thought I would find a different public health job and sort of like restart, but really it helped me realize that they were all connected, but just being connected into the program, being connected into UNC just opened up a hundred percent more doors, um, to even understand what jobs were out there, what kind of work was needed. And it really cemented my expertise in the health space versus, um, you know, the confusing, like, why is Food Network on your resume, right? And like, how does that, sorry, how does that relate? And so I think just the experience and the knowledge, but just sort of the networks that it helps you connect with was totally a game changer for me. Yeah, and, and I would also say that it, it doesn't give us an edge. It's, it's our whole basis. Um, if we didn't have our public health background, we would be an advertising agency for the lowest budget organizations out there. It, like w there would be no competition. We wouldn't have any credibility. We wouldn't have a business. So I think having the public health background and knowledge and everything Emily just talked about gives us the credibility to do the work we're doing. It also, uh, it, it gives, I mean, obviously it gives us like the skills and the knowledge that we need but um yeah it, it's yeah I, I I think I think we've been able to find sort of a niche here and one half of the niche is the is the public health degree and the other half is Emily and I's kind of diverse set of skills and experience that not everyone working in this space has but yeah we wouldn't have that without the MPH at all because we're also a lot of our clients are in, are obviously public health practitioners, and so for us to come in with that same ability to speak that language, with the additional skill sets that we have, is sort of a different choice that they make of where to spend their money versus hiring a complete outside creative agency that might make something really pretty but might not understand the language and the science that's necessary to get their ideas across. Um, so there's also like a comfort level there for them too that will understand their work as well as ours. 
And I think we're also, with our public health background, are able to advocate for bringing in the community as much as possible. I don't know that um, another type of agency would 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 do would know to do that or would advocate for that. Um, we do that as much as we possibly can. So I think that helps too in making things impactful and work. Uh, Sienna, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, thanks for that talk. Um, I just had, so going back to Emily, um, you mentioned you, that you had reached out to Catherine um, about, you know, talking about the, your experiences and forming this partnership. Um, as someone who wants to, you know, carry my own business, sometimes it can be a lot on one person to try to get everything done. And so I've had thoughts about um, partnering with people or reaching out. And I'm just curious about like how how have, did you navigate that, like figuring out who to partner with and like the conversation you all had about, you know, the logistics. And I think you all mentioned something about like, cause there's also the business side of this partnership. So the contracts between you two and how things will be allocated. So I'm just curious about like how that all went. And yeah, if you would love to speak to that, I'd be happy to hear. Yeah, I, so in 2009, I started Move Your Booty, which was a, um, online fitness community and um, eventually a health coaching company. And I did that all by myself mm -hmm. and it moved like, I had a really hard time figuring out what exactly that business was and what the service was. Um, and the, the speed at which this came together versus that is completely um, different because just having that other person there to split, you know, um, specialties, like the work I do is different than the work Catherine does. Sometimes a lot of it we do together. Um, but just having that person and it sort of, it wasn't like we went out looking to find someone to do this. It sort of came, was birthed together, but also that startup UNC class is a really safe place to try on those clothes and see if we work together well, um, without committing to anything. Um, I, I don't know if it's because we work in health. I don't know if it's because we're two women, but the all male teaching group there was convinced that we were just best friends doing a passion project. And we are, we are friends, but we had never worked on a group project together. We were in the same cohort. We knew each other, but I started grad school at six month old. I wasn't hanging out as much with my cohort as I would have liked. So like, it truly was a business partnership, um, that, came about in like a more formal way through that startup UNC class that I think was really helpful than just diving in head first. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It did come to, we were lucky that we had a little bit of um, serendipity getting together, but we had had a year of um, getting to know each other a little bit. We weren't like close friends or anything, but we, you know, we had, we were in our, our, at, we were at the end of our first year of the MPH. She knew me a little bit. She knew the work I was doing. I knew her a little bit. I knew the work she was doing. And so there was, I think there was a mutual interest in what we were doing. Um, so that helped. Um, the, the coming together was a very great sort of serendipitous event. Um, but yeah, we got a lot of practice. We got to you know, work on a couple things together going through Startup UNC. Startup UNC was really great for just letting us practice a lot of stuff and find out what worked and didn't. It could have been that we were like, gosh, we don't work well together. And that's not, that's not what happened. But it's not to say it's not without its challenges. Like we've had to, we've had really challenging experiences sometimes with each other. And we have a, we have a solid foundation for our relationship. We're really transparent with each other. We have different skills. We listen to each other. We override each other sometimes. Like we, it's it's like any solid relationship but um yeah I, I would say if I mean we wouldn't be I, I feel very confident we wouldn't be able to do it without each other so not that people can't people start businesses on their own all the time but um we get a lot of support from each other as well so uh, yeah I would say if 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 you're trying to figure out who you want to start with or who you want to work with like look around at who do you like how they work? Like Emily said earlier, she's like, I notice you're you're up at the cafe working from 7.30 to 9.30 every morning. Like, hmm, cool. Like, you know, who do you notice is doing cool things? Who do you notice that you like spending time with? And, you know, see if they're interested uh, and, and, and go through a couple small things to see how it works. So yeah, I don't know. That's, it's- Yeah. We, um, go ahead. 
Sorry, cut you off as I always do. I, I, even if, even if you're not sure if you want to actually run a business with one other person, which is also totally fine, it's nice to have a buddy. So if you have a buddy who is also interested in running their own business and creating something and kind of creating like a mentorship partnership together to say, like, we're not going to go into business together, but we're each going to push each other to like start our own. Um, I think that can be cool and start a UNC you are not allowed to go in solo. So you either have to come in with a partner or they will partner you up because some people want to go through the process but not necessarily have an idea, right? Which is common. They want to be a part of an entrepreneurial pursuit but they don't have that big idea and they want to be part of something. Um, so, because also you don't have to start a business in that class. You are just sort of running your idea through the process. So you could, so some, you could enroll in that class and be partnered with somebody who will join your team. So that can be helpful too. Thank you for that. Sorry, Siani. Um, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if you all wanted, you know, you spoke about that um, per first pro bono client that you worked with. What kind of decisions or, you know, what were you thinking about as you looked at whether or not that was a smart thing to do? I mean, you, obviously it's pro bono, so you're not having any pay and you're putting out resources. I mean, were there, were there different, were you getting some guidance on, you know, who would be the best first client to take? Can you talk a little bit about how you approach that? Um, we knew that what we were doing, there was a need for it and we sort of wanted to prove it. This was not a, a job that was many, 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 many hours. It was a meeting with um, the researcher and then we sort of created something and sent it back to her. So this wasn't like you're going to give me five hours every single week for the rest of the semester type pro bono work because that wouldn't have worked for us. But we sort of wanted to like try on the process. So but it was really finite and specific in what we were going to do. We created the, the product in that coffee shop in the health library. <laughs> so um, it wasn't super uh, heavy lift, you know, um, but it helped us sort of for her to understand how useful the product could be and for us to understand how we would wrap around actually spitting something out. Um, and, and at that time, I think we were we were in the stage of like, we need to grab every every opportunity that comes towards us. So it wasn't necessary. I mean, it was a strategic decision for sure, but it wasn't, we wouldn't have said no to much. I think if it would have been like a long-term volunteer thing, we would have had to say no to that. But yeah, yeah, it was a great opportunity to validate and show what we were doing. Um, we also needed something to show um, because we kept spouting and telling everybody, well, public health needs so many more visual tools. And, and they were like, great show us your visual tools. And we hadn't actually made any. So um, we needed to make, we were making them actually in separate jobs as ever, you know, students, we all work like a million jobs. And so we were creating them in other capacities, but we needed to make something together. Um, and so that was a great way to do it. The pro bono work that we've done more recently was much more involved, but that was sort of, you know, mission-based. Um, we had more time and resources to do that. And we wanted to kind of put that time and effort yeah, and we had a partner who was also committed to doing it on a pro bono basis, and it was a, a fruitful par partnership. So that that tends to be more of a, I mean, we get requests now to do, sometimes we get requests to do work that we can't take on, but yeah, we sometimes are able to. Yeah, for pro bono, I mean, you want to make sure you're getting out what you need of it as well, um, that it's not just like nice to volunteer for someone else. Even though it is sometimes. Which it also is. Thank you for that. Are there other questions? I have a few, but I don't want to be dominating this. Yeah, we obviously love talking about this, so keep them coming. I also had one more question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so working with the law school, I'm I'm also very curious about like how do you know when you're ready to present um I guess to ask for that type of help with making contracts? Cause I know for me, like I I want to do an health, a healthcare startup. So where I actually am going to be helping um, like patients, like touching people. So of course I need um, that, that legal side of things. Um, and I'm just curious about how, you know, like what, how did you know what to bring or was it, did you just talk to someone from this, um, the startup clinic and they kind of gave you an idea about if you were prepared enough to like 
get that get these type of things rolling like how did that work out for you all we wanted we had done so we were at the time we were two students who wanted to do this we had done a couple projects where we were hired as students we'd done some pro bono stuff and we didn't really know where to go next. And so we asked a lot of our contacts where to go. We went to a lot of the wrong places. And eventually someone said, there's a startup, there's actually two clinics um, that we looked into. There's one for like social, I think it's, I think it's only for nonprofits and it's called the social something startup clinic, I don't know. Uh, we, it wasn't right for us, um, even though like our mission was aligned with that, the, the structure of our organization was not. And then there's the startup law clinic um, and we decided that that was a better fit for us and they, we were lucky that they accepted us. But we, so we had done the work enough to know that we needed some help. I think we had, we had executed one contract with a client on our own, I mean contract, we had done it on our own they were also a very, very new organization. And so they didn't know how to do contracts either. And I think we kind of realized, okay, we're now at a stage where we've had one where we didn't have the support that maybe we would want. And like, let's make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, and also we didn't know what we wanted to be as an organization. And we didn't know what Emily and I needed between us and we didn't know how to do it. So we were at a point where we, we knew we needed help because we had done it without the help and it, it worked kind of, but not as well as we wanted it to, if that makes sense. Emily, do you have anything to add? Yeah, we were faking it till we made it and then um, we couldn't fake it anymore. But there's also, um, and we needed help, but there's also a process for the clinic. Like the, you apply, they tell you if it's a good idea. We had a long meeting um, just like to in, for them to interview us and hear what we needed, what our thoughts were. Um, and then an acceptance process. So it's not something you'd fall into and realize you don't have all the things you need. You know, they won't let you, they'll help, they'll help you understand what you need before you actually are admitted. Um, so, but there's also, um, I would say there's also a ton of other type of legal type organizations that will do a phone call with you or um, give you answers to, you know, three questions that you're kind of afraid to ask because you think they're so basic, but they're not, they're great questions, you know? So I think there's a lot of um, routes that you can go to kind of get those answers and make sure that you're all ready if the time does come for you to then get involved in something like that. Great, thank you. I also wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, you mentioned it sounds like maybe you were dealing with a little bit of, um, I don't want to nays say naysayers, but like, oh, you guys are just good friends and you sort of have this pipe dream. Um, but at, so at this, like sort of trying to work against that and, so, and also gain this unearned media or whatever you want to say, like these articles being written for you, like, how did you, how'd you go about that? How'd you bolster your um, confidence on that? Cause that's, I think that's tough and impressive that you did it. Yeah. Um, can I go, Emily? Yeah, go. We were always confident. Um, I, I think, I think, and we did have mentors who would whisper in our ear, like, no, you're good, while other people were saying this isn't gonna work. So that that we we were I was confident. Um we had people who were supportive. And I think what we had to do is we just had to prove it, which isn't a bad thing. Like you should have to prove your business ideas and you should have to prove that it's viable. Um, so we got hired and we started producing work and we made it viable. And um, it's not like we had so many naysayers, but we had people who just didn't understand the space we were working in, um, who didn't understand how we were structured. We had people who didn't support, a lot of people who did not support the idea that we're both 50% owners and that we're co-leaders of the business who want there to be, you know, one. one. Um, so things like that, that we just kind of had to show that the way that we were doing it was going to work and um, has worked. And um, that's kind of, yeah. And it, it, yeah, again, I think you should have to prove that. Um, maybe, yeah, I, yeah. There's, there's maybe a balance there, but Emily, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think um, 
in the first year of the MPH program, I had no idea what I was going to do with the MPH. Um, and once the light bulb went off that I could do what I used to do, but for public health, um, and my husband turned to me and he said, you had to go to grad school to figure that out. Like I could have told you that a year ago, <laughs> but I did have to go to grad school to figure it out. Um, that made me a lot more confident because I knew how to do that in a way. I also knew that was a viable, there are lots of businesses like that. Um, like there's a lot of content creation businesses out in the world and there just aren't enough for public health. So I knew that that was a need. Um, and because we were both sort of reaching back into our past experiences, we knew that that was really solid um, and that that mix was different than anything else that was out there because it's a super random mix of experiences, right? But they all sort of lend themselves really well to public health um, communication. So I also think I knew what it, you know, working for a production company that went from like a really small production company to a huge production company um, that was eventually bought and just like watching that business um, grow and also being an employee in that business who like totally burnt out along the process. I knew what um, I wanted and what I didn't want for future work. And so um, that really helped us shape kind of where we were headed. Um, I also think, I mean, we're not, a, obviously we're not a typical startup. We didn't take a bunch of funding. We're really like a small business that wanted to do the work, but it was really helpful for us to formalize our process through the startup, you know, um, resources that we took advantage of. And so that I think gave us confidence too, just like we know, we know the need, even though it's not an obvious need to everybody else. That's a good place to be. Thank you for that. Um, I think we might be rounding out here um, or hitting the top of the hour. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. I think this was really helpful and um, engaging and will um, live on an in, uh, uh, forever as a recording on our website. So we'll pass along to others who have um, registered and weren't able to make it. So Tiani is going to drop an eval link into the chat. Um, for those of you who are on here, we'd love to get your thoughts about um, what you think about this programming and any future programming. And again, thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us. Thanks everybody. And, and thank you for all your support throughout. We appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take Bye, care. everybody. All right. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting and the recording. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.